as we keep challenging the brain, it continues to, um, I don't want to say develop, but that's kind of the word I'm looking at. So even though we, we get older and we think, oh, you get older, you lose everything, the more active we keep it, the longer it stays alive. I know I'm not using the right terminology, but yeah. is, is that... Just the fact that you're speaking is good. This was one of my biggest challenges. <laughs> no, he's, he's being very okay, serious. Yeah. No, he's, he's serious, and that's why I ask. Um, I have been told by doctors that I was the way I was. I had been almost three years out with no answers as to what was wrong, and Dr. Roselle discovered that I had a right-sided brain injury. MRIs and CT scans don't show anything. I stuttered. We had a lot. But um, once he discovered the right-sided brain injury and treated it, I'm back 100%. I would have never been able to do this job without him. So it's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, I'm some of the injuries are microscopic, and they're not going to show up in the big scans, but they'll show up on a functional map uh, because the function is reduced. And mine was three years after the fact, so. What kind of results like. are you having with people, um, elderly that have dementia and Alzheimer's? If I can get them in the early stages of dementia, I can help them. Um, when they're middle to late dementia, you know, it's very frustrating for them and for me, and uh, you know, the progress is minimal. So when you look at cost versus benefit, it's usually not worth the effort. Um, so, you know, again, if you uh, get age-related cognitive decline, myocognitive impairment, early stage dementia, can help a lot. Um, but, you know, they reach a certain threshold where, you know, it's a little late to do much. But even if you do an intervention with early dementia, won't they still have dementia after? Well, yeah, it's usually it's a progressive process. We can mm -hmm. slow down the progression, um, and we can actually improve functioning in some areas. Um, but um, yeah, we, we buy in more time. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to add something as you're talking about this. And Cranial cycle therapy is kind of like what the study group is about, and this is related in, in a lot of ways. These functional maps show me something about how the brain is working. Um, it's sometimes, I think, possible to change, rewire the brain mm -hmm. and, and change architecture, change function, but also change architecture. But what we're learning to do in cranial cycle therapy is touch the body and change the architecture, and that sometimes can change the functioning, but not always. So in cases where I've had all the rhythms return and everything feels right, but there's still short-term memory loss, there's something uh, in the functioning of the brain that may not be correct. So this is how it works well together. Question? Yeah, I got a question. Okay. So when you sleep and stuff like that, that repairs damage brain cells, right? Yeah. Right, and we're gonna be talking about sleep in just a minute, so. Particularly when you get into the stage four sleep, the deep sleep, and uh, uh, that's that's very vital. Um, that's why if you have something like apnea going on that's keeping you from getting into that deep sleep, um, you know, you're doing damage and you're not allowing the brain and the body to repair itself. Is that why you would say that you'd be tired a lot, yawning? And, yeah. You know. That's one of the reasons, yeah. When, when the brain is working harder and two, the brain's not getting oxygen you know, when it really needs it. And, uh, you know, it's tiring to keep waking up during the night. <laughs> so I want to um, just say, because just finish that thought and add to that, is that you are, these guys that are therapists, you're a neurofeedback machine. You have a brain that's producing like millions, if not billions of frequencies. And so when George gives me a map, I kind of know which frequencies might work in what areas of the brain. But when you touch somebody and you're doing any kind of therapy, you're exchanging frequencies, you're exchanging energies. And just know that's true. And then when you get definition for that and you can hone in, you can, like George said earlier, it's like you can be precise in what you're able to give to somebody. It works way better. So um, this, cl this class is a little bit about how we can connect and exchange energy with people on that frequency level. And not just being in the white light, but get understand what frequencies are and how we can be more precise about managing them when we're touching some way. The other thing that I find really exciting is uh, recently I've been doing more and more work with PTSD 
uh, focusing on veterans. And uh, um, we have an amazing mineral technology that, that gives us rapid results. And it works on uh, trying to activate the circuit in the brain associated with the PTSD and then using a, a neuromodulation, a sound device to match that frequency. And uh, once we get on the, uh, the right frequency plane, you know, we get that resonance that uh, can actually intensify the experience for the person. But then we can turn another dial and introduce a, another frequency that uh, is competing and it breaks up that circuit. And uh, we get pretty amazing um, our results with that. I don't have the talent that Ken does to do the frequency with my fingers, so I use devices. <laughs> you get the, we get there the, the hardware way. and I got the software, and it works well together. Works so yeah. it works good. Um, another question, and then we're going to go on to the sleep plan. Okay, so what would be an adequate amount of sleep, sleep so your brain could be fully functional? Uh, I don't think it's quantity, I think it's quality. Um, you know, some people that can you know, do quite well on four or five hours. Most people need about seven hours. Uh, I need about six and a half to seven. Um, uh, and it's important to, you know, if you, you know, can, can sleep through the night. Uh, um, another exciting thing that I'm involved in, all kinds of things, but uh, it's called brain music therapy. and. Uh, that involves uh, one office visit, and uh, we do a four-channel EEG recording um, for about five minutes. I suppose resting, we send it off to a lab, and they can um, pull out the uh, desired uh, segments of that. You're not getting enough sleep, are you? So. <laughs> We're working too hard. <laughs> or am I boring? <laughs> anyway, they can they can pull out the uh, desired segments of the EEG. Uh, they have algorithms where they convert that to a music file because there's a lot of similarities between brain rhythms and music rhythms and um, they can send back a soundtrack that you can download onto your uh, portable device and you listen at night with headphones. Your ears hear nice music, your brain recognizes the rhythmicity of it as itself in the desired state and it uh, mirrors that. You know, so. It's kind of feedback and the training at the same time. And I've had very good results with that uh, for restoring sleep. Because um, otherwise the brain can go kind of go in and out of the state and uh, this kind of entrains it into the desired state. And uh, it works very well for people that live outside of the area and they can't come here for regular treatments. Uh, so again, that's one of the few kinds of home training that I, I really endorse. So, all right. I got, I used up my 10 minutes, I think. <laughs> Did you use that? <laughs> that one passed so fast. Okay. I'll send you an invoice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Let's start with kind of setting up, and I said for this afternoon, I said, hey, you want to talk to the doctor 10 minutes with me? Because now I'm going home. <laughs> Dinner's waiting. Um, so I'm glad the questions came about sleep. And um, so I'm working with. Uh, one year old right now is diagnosed with epilepsy at five, at 14 years old, and he had a head injury at five years old, and he's not sleeping. So, if George worked on him all the time, and I worked on him all the time, and he's not sleeping, he's still not going to reach optimal health because he's not sleeping. So, I'd like to introduce Adam Andrew. He's the president of the American Sleep Apnea Association, and I want you to talk about sleep apnea and what maybe what you went through. And also the new app that came out and how awesomely amazing that is. So welcome Adam Ander. He's going to talk about sleep. He's a sleep expert. So I, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV. I'm also a patient of Ken's and Ken's a very responsible since my family and I relocated to Sarasota maybe five years ago from the Bay Area in Northern California. Uh, it's being a part of my treatment team and puzzle for helping me make a full recovery. Uh, long story short, uh, I'm not the president. But well, I thought you were the president. I, I'm, I'm the, the chief patient officer is the title that they have me on there. <laughs> CTO. <laughs> so I'm not an employee, so I'm in nobody's uh, pocket, so to speak. So I have no conflicts of interest, mm -hmm. uh, which in the research world and in the mm -hmm. policy government world is, goes, makes a big difference. So uh, at 35 years old, I was diagnosed, uh, I stopped breathing 150 times an hour. 
Uh, I was so severe in a hospital setting that within 20 minutes they had a mask on me. Uh, that first night of waking up was the best drug of my life. And I've done every drug there was in the book. Um, I felt like I was shot out of a cannon and I was reborn, literally. Uh, unfortunately, that is a not the experience that the majority of people or patients have, in that most people are titrated the right way. They, for me, any little bit of oxygen was better than the 30 plus years before that I didn't get. So my brain right away knew, oh, this is what it's like to be awake, alert, sharp, happy, not negative. 5.36 in the morning out of that study, I ran home to my wife, found the secret of life, I figured it all out. <laughs> the healthcare system then offered a, me a two week waiting period for the insurance to kick in to get the machine that I then would have to learn how to use on my own because there's no incentive for the system for anyone to hold your hand while you're cognitively impaired because you're sleep deprived to learn how to acclimate to your treatment. Make a long story short, uh, about a year later, as I was starting to get better and make better decisions, and I was riding that roller coaster, managing my apnea, managing fibromyalgia, managing allergic reactions to statins and bilateral herniations in my neck, and my eyes were going twitchy, and my mother's telling my wife to leave me because I'm off my rocker. Uh, I had a, uh, at the time, a six month year old baby um, when when my best friend who was straight out of med school so was newly trained looked at me one night while on vacation and said I know what's wrong with you and guess what as he's not looking at me he's talking to my mother he's like, I know what's I know what was wrong with your father like, what's that he goes not only do you have apnea but your apnea led to your led to your father's at that time early onset Alzheimer's which we now know is vascular dementia and Louis Parkinson's uh, Louis body Parkinson's, um, but the, the true telltale thing in, in the whole story was that there's a whole cottage industry set up on testing and diagnosing. There's nothing set up to treat. The truth of the matter is sleep is something we do a third of our lives. The traditional healthcare system, doctors get two hours of treatment throughout all their years in, um, in, uh, in, during the residency, and when you think of that, that we all sleep a third of our lives doesn't correlate the education, let alone the knowledge branch. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in the Bay Area, which was the home of the father of sleep medicine, which is, the doctor's name was Bill DeMent, who discovered REM in the 50s. And they literally were observing patients in trials in Chicago and then eventually in San Francisco, and they could see people's eyes moving while their, while their eyes were closed. So they then started to map the different stages of sleep. So someone like me who stopped breathing 150 times an hour before treatment, I was getting micro sleeps. I never got full waves like a cosine. If any of you know what you know, know what that looks like. It's, it's it's almost like this. You start awake, you go down, and you come back up. And then you, if you do that cycle about four times or every 90 minutes, um, you're going to have good quality sleep. Now, who's getting those kind of good cycles in sleep? We have electronics. We have worries that keep us up at night. We have animals. Children that wake us up, our bed partner might wake us up because they're snoring. We have light pollution, we have sound pollution, we have all sorts of things. We have what we ate the night before. Is that giving us reflux? Is that giving us indigestion? All these things are waking us up, whether we know it or not, at different levels of our sleep throughout the night. So for me to come back to that study that first night, I had therapy. My brain got the first time in 30 years I went on the ride. I like to make a lot of references to movies and stuff like that. To me, it's the, the movie that came out that James Cameron did, Pandora. I put on that mask. I, I'd rather sometimes be asleep because I get the dream for the first time that I didn't do the 35 years prior. I'm about six, seven years post initial treatment. In the middle of my entire treatment, or right in the beginning, when I was telling you about my friend who realized what was wrong with me, my daughter was now two years old. We, I then looked at her and I'm like, wait, she's got the same problem because we have the same face. It has to, in, our, in most families' cases, it has to do with anatomical structure. So if you look at my nose, it's really small. Uh, if I bite into an apple, my daughter has a bigger bite than I do. I have a mouth of a five-year-old. My palate's really up high, it's narrow and arched. Uh, my chin is recessed. I now have a bigger BMI because over the years I've put on weight. 
I had acne when I was just young and I was just getting the rail, nothing to do. The obesity is a secondary uh, manifestation of being tired. When you're tired, what do you do? You put in fuel into this into the into the into the into the, the engine. Um, am I on just the track you want? Okay. Just tell my story. <laughs> Alright, so um, long story short, daughter stops breathing at two years old twenty seven times an hour. Anything for a child over one is abnormal. Uh, pediatrician told me I was crazy, the allergist because she was breaking out and had eczema and all sorts of issues. Oh, there's nothing wrong with her. I used the parental hair on the back of the neck, tuition, looked at my wife, she's like, ah, just anything to shut me up. She took the, my daughter in and literally within 24 hours of having my daughter's tonsils and adenoids out, she went from 27 times down to 12. So she increased about 300% her quality of her sleeping. She was still at 12 times an hour, she stopped breathing in her sleep long enough to interrupt her sleep architecture. So it's like your computer, you have too many files open, too many apps open, it's been open too long, you have too much memory, what does that computer do? It freezes, it slows up, 